Hello and welcome to the Liverpool.com podcast. I'm James Martin and I'll be your host this week. I'm joined by the excellent Matt Addison and Ben Boxack. And today we're going to be discussing all things Diogo Jota. There was a little bit of an injury scare in the Arsenal win, but uh, provided that's just a knock, he's seemingly a nailed on starter, at least until Roberto Firmino gets back and he bagged himself a nice goal. But he's still something of an enigma in terms of the long term plan, in terms of what the team gains and loses when he's in it. Uh, so the Arsenal goal, well taken, Matt, wasn't it? But is, is that Jota's biggest strength for you, that sort of clinical streak? I think so, yeah. I think it's it's something that, you know, we, we kind of saw it in fits and starts, really, fits and starts I should say, uh, for, for Wolves in, in kind of, sort of, you know, he, he kind of went on a run of scoring in five or six for them and, and then didn't do it for, for a good few weeks. But I think at, at Liverpool, it's it's been a lot more consistent. Obviously, had the, the period of time out injured last season. Uh, it was about three months, I think, wasn't it, that, that he was injured? I think it might have been a, a knee injury, which which didn't help Liverpool um, sort of in sort of December, January time. Um, but generally speaking, when he's in the team, he does tend to, to score. And I think th- th- there's lots of differences that I'm sure we'll, we'll get into between those two players. But yeah, for me, the, the fact that he is clinical, the fact that he is able to, to kind of get himself into the right positions and, and sort of get himself into the six-yard box, which is obviously something that, that Firmino doesn't particularly do. I think is is a huge benefit. I think there's there's still maybe a bit of a question to, to ask in terms of is through the middle his best position. I think for me it might actually be off the left, which I think possibly at some point when Liverpool have to to be without Sadio Mane, I think that might be the, the sort of long term position for him. But of course that the fact that Liverpool you know bought him in, I think was was a big a big factor was the fact that he can play in all three of those positions. He's not really had to play off the, the right-hand side, but he can do that. And obviously with a squad as, as small and as needing to be versatile as what Liverpool have, I think the fact that he can play in, in all three positions is is a massive thing as well, to be honest. Yeah, that's the thing. He was probably never going to come in and usurp one of the front three straight away. But in terms of how it's gone particularly recently, Ben, it has been that sort of Firmino role where he's been tasked with playing most often. Uh, So we've talked about what he brings in terms of that kind of clinical edge compared to Firmino. But on the flip side, what would you say Liverpool kind of lose when it's Jota in the team ahead of Firmino? I think what Liverpool lose really in comparison to Firmino is uh, Firmino drops back quite a lot and his sort of creativity and creating space for Salah and Mane. You don't really get that with Jota. Jota does tend to like to play in and around the box or on the last line of defence. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. It's uh, obviously that it means Salah and Mane have to take up different roles and they tend to kind of drift further out wide rather than when Firmino plays, they come more central. But it's it's worked out well for Liverpool on both occasions, really. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, it's a tricky one because obviously Firmino has been so sort of central to to what Klopp has done at Liverpool. It's he's almost come to epitomise the the system that he's put in place. But equally, you'd think there's not really anyone who could directly replace what he does. So there maybe has to be some kind of evolution. Do you think at some point, Matt? I think so. I think it's it's about evolution. But even in the, the short term, it's about having that different option. Obviously, not all all four of them are, are available at this moment in time. But I think there will be certain matches where you might prefer one over the other. The fact that Liverpool have got an extra option is, is an evolution in itself compared to, obviously, when Liverpool uh, won things in the past in, in sort of two or three seasons ago, they didn't really have that extra option. Jota has, has come in and, and provided that. So it's it, it's not just a case of, you know, what, what do we think in the future the Liverpool need to evolve and to get better and, and to change things and, and to make sure that they don't get found out. But it's also a case of, of in the short term, having that option as well. If you, if you need someone off the bench, I think Jota is probably the, the best one. Um, I suppose the argument would be for, for Mohamed Salah as well to, to come off the bench. I'm sure he's not a bad option to have on there. It's just that we don't tend to, to see that too often. But I think out of, of Mane, Firmino and, and Jota, he is the one that can make the most difference really in terms of, of being an impact player. And I think it's it's because of that he offers a little bit more directness, a little bit more of, of a direct threat to, to the centre-backs. Um, I think, you know, 
obviously against Arsenal, Jota does well and, and did score. But I think in the past, maybe Firmino has, has done that and maybe offered it a little bit more of, of a rounded game against that kind of opponent. But I do think there will be opponents where Diogo Jota is is more suited even at the moment. So, yeah, moving forward, I think it, it is, it's an evolution. I think there's still there's still other evolutions that, that you can make in terms of, of the tactics, the, the fact that they could go for maybe a more fixed number nine and, and maybe have Salah and, and Jota running off. But yeah, both short-term and long-term. I think he's just the, the perfect sort of player really to, to complement the three players that Liverpool already had. Mm, it's an interesting one, like you say, in terms of kind of horses for courses, because you look at the, the sort of pressing statistics and the kind of headline figures, it's like, OK, maybe he's come in as the as the sort of eventual Firmino replacement. You know, Klopp and Linders have both called him pressing monster in the past, things like that. But then you dive into it a bit more, Ben, and you see that Firmino's presses are taking place sort of primarily in the middle third of the pitch, whereas Jota is very much kind of final third presses, trying to force those errors. I mean... We kind of saw it at Arsenal. He didn't necessarily force the the Nuno Tavares error, but he was kind of on hand to pounce on it. So I suppose there's that kind of question of, you know, not all pressing is equal. And just the fact that he presses a lot doesn't necessarily mean he's the, he's the shoe-in replacement for Firmino, if you like. No, absolutely not. But, I mean, like I said, both both methods work. Like we saw against Arsenal, him pressing from the front worked against Arsenal and Firmino's press kind of primarily in the middle also works but I think if you do look at stats I think Firmino's only averaging one less press per 90 in the final opposition's final third and shorter so it's not too different uh, when you compare the two um, I do think I think I agree with Matt I do think Jota's best position is probably on the left wing which we'll probably see more of as sort of Mane declines in age. Um, and centrally, it will be interesting to see who whether we can find someone who is similar to Firmino, because I think there are a few options out there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, both methods work. <laughs> that, that, that's essentially the point here. Um, mm. And I think that gives Liverpool hope going forward because it proves that you don't even necessarily need a direct replacement for Firmino. You just need someone who kind of fits the system, fits the gig and press and uh, heavy metal football, like Jota. Yeah, it's an interesting point you made as well about the fact that Firmino is pretty close in the final third pressing numbers while still posting sort of significantly bigger numbers in the middle third. It's just that kind of sheer work rate he gets through that, that makes him such an interesting player. I mean, I don't want to make it a... Firmino podcast and we're here to talk about Jota but I suppose Matt do you think when Jota is in the team ahead of Firmino there's that kind of almost defensive aspect of the game which is which is maybe lacking maybe Liverpool look a little more open when he's in yeah I think that there is that I think it's partly the pressing I think Jota in terms of the volume of, of the pressing it's it's not an issue as Ben says it's it's relatively similar to, to what Firmino does but it's more the kind of the intelligence of, of Roberto Firmino I'm not quite sure where he gets it from I think it must just be a partly a natural instinct thing I think it, it's obviously coached as well which you'd hope that obviously Jota can can improve working with Liverpool's coaching staff in in the the, the coming seasons but I think for now yeah that the, there is a kind of defensive question in terms of sort of the intelligence of the pressing the timing of it the volume is not is not massively different as I say but I think it's not just the pressing as well I think obviously Firmino's link play, the fact that he drops deep and, and can kind of keep the ball and, and help Liverpool play out a little bit more. I think Diogo Jota, particularly in the first half against Arsenal, didn't really touch the ball, didn't really see too much of it, where if you sort of put Firmino into that position, maybe he would have been able to, to help Liverpool bypass the Arsenal press. Obviously, that's kind of a, an attacking thing, but also it's, it's defensive in, in the sense that you're a little bit more secure with the ball. You're not going to lose it in dangerous areas. I think Diogo Jota at times can sort of facilitate opponents' abilities to, to counter-attack, which is obviously where Liverpool have, have struggled at, at times this season. So, look, it's it's not a huge difference between the two. Again, I don't think you know it's it's a massive drop-off, but I do think there is an improvement, certainly in, in pressing, but, but probably even more so, to be honest, just in terms of, of keeping possession. Obviously, if Liverpool are, are in control, Liverpool have the ball, the opposition can't score and it's it's sometimes, you know, 
it, it does sometimes feel like Jota gives it away a little bit too easily at times, but you know, it's something he can work on. And like we've said before, it's it's not necessarily a natural position for him. It's not something that he's had to do at Wolves. It's something he's had to learn. And you know, the, the fact that he's got as far as he has in this short time probably suggests yeah, good things for the future. For sure. And as you say, like if his future is sort of lying on the left wing there, then maybe it becomes less of an issue naturally over time anyway. But it's uh, we have touched on it, but it is an interesting one, this sort of positional question in the sense that he's come in perhaps just to do a job when Firmino is not available at first at centre forward. But then he's he's been showing these elite attacking instincts I mean, popping up with a lot of headed goals, which no one was necessarily really expecting, just seems to have that natural centre forwards movement um so there's a case to keep him there uh, ben do you reckon he'll always be that kind of versatile plug in anywhere sort of player or do you really think left wing that's where he's gonna eventually find himself settled and fixed much like Mane and salah aren't really moving for liverpool these days i think for the vast majority of his liverpool career hopefully it'll be a long one i i can see him just drifting into the left wing and playing in the central role as well, covering when needed. Uh, but I, in theory, it, when he does get older and he uh, inevitably loses a bit of pace, I think because of his finishing instinct and his ability in the box, I, I could see him becoming a number nine uh, beyond his 30s, really. Kind of like how Ronaldo changed his style of football in the last few years. Uh, to be just a pure finisher because he does have that ability to to finish inside the box and and find spaces in the box and uh, yeah as you mentioned even his heading like that's that's been a big feature of his play at Liverpool. Yeah, it's I mean it's a long way in the future there, but that's the sort of that's the sort of planning that FSG are doing. I suppose that's the reason they want to get in younger players so they can get this kind of succession planning in place. Um, and Matt, do you think when the time comes to buy in another one for the front three, which should hopefully be this coming summer, really, if you think about it, do you think that'll be high up on FSG's wish list, another kind of versatile player who can sort of play across the line? Or do you think that there'll, there'll be a sort of particular position in mind? No, I think, well, I, I suppose it, it could change because of the contract situation. If they didn't want to agree a new deal for Sadio Mane, for example, you might have to go out and get a specific player for that. But I think... As it stands right now, I think that's what I would be looking to do is, is to try and find another version of, of Diogo Jota, really. And I think you, know, you, you asked the, the question to Ben there of, you know, is he going to play on the left or, or through the middle in future? I think it basically depends on on who else Liverpool bring in. It's, it's not necessarily something that you can plan for or, or think about. I mean, obviously, Sadio Mane, when he first came into Liverpool, played on the right-hand side. When Liverpool looked mm -hmm. at Mohamed Salah, they looked at, at plenty of other options as well. I think if they'd have bought someone to come in and, and play on the left, then Mane would have just stayed on the right. So it's it, it's one of those that I think will change almost depending on basically who's available at, at the right price at, at a certain time. And I think they've probably got a good idea of maybe five or ten names that they might look at, but it's just a case of you know almost leaving it down to chance. Whichever one they get, that might dictate what happens for, for Diogo Jota in the future. So, yeah, I suppose that that ties in perfectly, doesn't it, with the um, the fact that they have to be versatile. They have to play one or two positions because you know if this new player comes in and, and plays in a certain position, that might have a knock on effect. If they then get injured, it might revert back to, to what it was before. It's all of these different things that, that we just can't predict. So, yeah, my, my guess would be that they'd go for, you know, a, a, a player who can play at least two of, of the three front positions, possibly all three of them. Um, but, yeah, for, for, for Diogo Jota, I think it's not necessarily a case of, you know, will he become one of the first names on the team sheet? It's, it's more a case of whether that will be left, central, or, or possibly even on the right, depending on, on what Liverpool do. And obviously, you know, in, in future, we don't know who the, the next manager might be, things like that. I mean, for Diogo Jota, it's, it's just almost a blank canvas, really, of, of whatever he wants to be, wherever he wants to play. There's always going to be opportunities, I think. Yeah, that is a bit of a minefield when it comes to recruitment over the next couple of seasons because, I mean, FSG will have in the back of their mind that, you know, Klopp will probably be moving on 2024. So you're signing players for the system, but also in the back of your mind, you've got that idea that 
they need to be able to potentially play a slightly different system and, and no one knows who the new coach is going to be and FSG aren't going to be able to to plan for that. So it's it's a critical time, really. And I guess that also plays into the idea of versatility being a particularly key trait for the for signings for the next couple of years. Um, you mentioned the price point for whoever comes in next. Uh, and the price point for Jota was something of a... Uh, of a debate point when he first signed, there were a few eyebrows raised. He come off not maybe not the best season for Wolves, Ben, but Liverpool forked out forty million odd pounds. Um, what were your initial kind of instincts when when that deal was agreed? To be honest with you, I thought it was a good move. I was I, I quite liked him before when he was at Wolves, and uh, he didn't have the greatest of seasons in the Premier League, but he was quite decent in the Europa League and. Uh, I thought Liverpool at the time just very much needed someone uh, to come in and sort of uh, play back up to Mane, Salah and Firmino that we needed a bit of freshening up. And uh, yeah, I thought he was the perfect candidate really. And uh, you saw his the confidence with, with in his first interview. I, I could tell instantly that he wasn't phased by coming to Liverpool and making the step up. And I think um, in the end, £40 million proved to be a, a good deal for him. Um, yeah, I think, sure. as well, quickly, I think as well, I think as well, it wasn't it only like uh, £15 million up front uh, with uh, instalments. So um, in the time of the pandemic, I think Michael Edwards sort of arranged a good deal for Liverpool. Yeah, it's uh, possibly an underrated part of that, the deal. Like you said, that kind of payment scheduling, That's it, it was always going to have to be the way for any deal that came in that summer. I mean, Werner was being linked around the same time, I think, and that was that was kind of what put paid to any potential interest there. Um, and yeah, ultimately, a lot of people were saying, you know, Werner's the much better deal. Liverpool should have just paid up that money up front but in terms of who's had the bigger impact so far you, you know there's no question really so yeah I think at that stage as well there was kind of a chasm between the wider footballing reaction to the move and Liverpool fans there's there's almost a sense now that supporters are just going to trust whichever transfer move Michael Edwards and, and you know FSG make obviously there's change behind the scenes now with with Edwards off at the end of the season but there's lots of continuity with Julian Ward taking over he's sort of had an apprenticeship there so I suppose Matt, whoever comes in as the kind of next jotter, there will be there will be some faith that it's it's the right one. Yeah, that was that was basically my thoughts when it happened. Were I was slightly surprised that it was I think forty one million up front, possibly rising to to four, well, not up front, but you know a guaranteed fixed fee and then a possible four uh, more million in, in add ons. I thought it was it was a lot of money, but you know I've made that mistake in the past. I thought when Sadio Mane came in for thirty million or so, that was you know a strange deal, but obviously been completely proven wrong on that. So I think there's there's been enough deals now to to trust Liverpool. But it is interesting there. You mentioned obviously Julian Ward, the, the sort of switch around with with Michael Edwards leaving Liverpool. I think there will be you know, next summer, maybe a little bit more scrutiny on what happens. It's going to have to be a, a good summer, I think, for, for Liverpool to get back to a position where they are, you know, or supporters are generally just sort of, you know, given, um, you know, a free pass almost for, for whoever comes in, you know, it's it's going to be a good one. I think, you know, next summer, there, there will be a little bit more um, scrutiny and, and sort of a few more eyes from other clubs across Liverpool. I think obviously Michael Edwards is is far from the only one within that recruitment team who's capable of of picking out these deals and, and negotiating them. But I think you know when somebody is as crucial and, and vital in uh, sort of Liverpool's past few seasons moves on, there's always going to be a little bit of, of consternation really in terms of, of what might happen next. But yeah, I, I wouldn't expect that the recruitment to change too much, but. They could definitely do with getting one or two of these deals right next summer just to to get off on the the right foot and and get that trust back to to what it should be really so it will be it will be an interesting summer i think next year and that segues very nicely into the next talking point which is who the potential next jota could be um potential candidates who can sort of fit that same mold we've touched upon the kind of key elements that, that player would need to have in terms of versatility potentially in terms of that kind of value it's it's not necessarily going to be someone like Jota like Mane who had the kind of quality without the consistency but you wouldn't be surprised if it was someone in that mold but 
I'll open it up wider than that then. Just who, in general terms, do you think could maybe be uh, someone catching FSG's eye? I think there's a few candidates out there, uh, in all fairness. Um, lots, of, lots of them tend to play for Red Bull because they just play a similar system. So there's Karim Adeyemi, who's doing well in the Champions League. I don't think he's going to be coming to Liverpool. It looks like he's closer to Dortmund or Bayern Munich. Uh, but there's also Christopher Nkunku, who's doing very well or in the Champions League and in the Bundesliga. And uh, I quite like him. His technical ability is similar to Firmino. And he he's also quite a frequent presser. So he does the pressing side of the game. Also a decent finisher as well. Um, if you look at his hat-trick against Man City, they were not bad finishes. Um, so he seems like a bit of a combination of Schotter and Firmino. Mm. And then uh, Jonathan David as well at Lille, who is uh, someone who presses a lot. Uh, maybe not as technical as Firmino, doesn't tend to get involved in the build-up play as much, but um, he's more of a Diego Schotter type number nine, but he's also doing very well, and, very well, and we know he's on the club's radar, uh, was on the club's radar at least anyway, when uh, they were looking at potential number nines before Diego Schotter came in in the summer of 2020. So I think those three stand out for me in particular. Uh, any of them I'd be happy with in the summer. <laughs> Yeah, and then Kunku as well has that sort of interesting career progression from sort of the middle of the park into the centre forward role. Uh, Firmino, he's been, you know, he's mostly been a centre forward throughout his professional career, but, you know, it's supposedly started out in that kind of deeper role as well. And maybe that's, we were touching upon it earlier, where he gets those instincts from. Maybe that's part of it, the sort of forward with a midfielder's outlook. So, yeah, it would be interesting to see how that translated with, with Nkunku at Liverpool. Definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, Matt, in terms of maybe the Premier League, do you reckon there's there's another one that of those kind of underrated talents who Klopp could get a hold of and turn from turn from a talent into a sort of consistent world beating player? Yeah, I think there's, there's there's a couple of names obviously that have been linked with Liverpool and and would be interesting. I think let's start with Rafinha uh, at Leeds. I think is is a really good player. I think there's there's a lot to like about him. Again, pressing work rate being in that Leeds team is it's just inevitable that he's going to have that but he's got the the quality and, and the decision making I think to, to come in and, and make an impact for Liverpool again is one that we know is is one that, that Liverpool have, have looked at and, and do like the only question mark that I'd have is that obviously he plays on the same side as, as Mohamed Salah can he play through the middle yeah probably can but it's maybe not quite as, as natural as, as maybe a few of, of the other options. And Harvey Barnes would be the other one that I'd, I'd pick out, maybe not having quite as, as good a season. I know he was sort of injured for, for the last couple of months of last season, hasn't quite got back to, to those heights that, that he was at before that. But I think, again, that's one that's maybe slightly under the radar, maybe one that, you know, maybe a Manchester City or a Chelsea wouldn't go for. But I think, you know, for, for Liverpool to, to plug him into to the team. I think it, it could be really interesting. I think, again, it, it, there's a bit of a question mark over does he only play off the left? Can he play in, in the other roles? But I do think there's there's enough quality there to, to sort of come in and, and take the, the next step at, at Liverpool, really. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. Um, I think a lot of it will come down to the price tag. I don't think you want to be spending more than than what they paid on on Jota I think it's got to be around that sort of, of fee again which to be honest makes me think it, it might be one of those that, that Ben's mentioned I think you, you're more likely to get Jonathan David for a reasonable fee for example than you know obviously Leicester demand absolutely top money for for players Harry Maguire and Riyad Mahrez and, and so on and so forth so yeah it, it would be more more easy to adapt if it if it was a Premier League player, but I think it's it's more likely that Liverpool will find a little bit more value elsewhere. But you know, the, the, the only thing I would say with all of this is that we've just reeled off five names there. I'm sure there are others. It's Mila Sarr is is one that Liverpool have looked at. The big frustration for me is that Liverpool didn't do that last summer because it's not like the options are not there. It's just they just needed to to pick one of those really. So yeah, be interesting to see what they do. They've got to do it next summer, but. I do wonder whether they might think possibly they could have done it a year earlier. Yeah, and Ismail Assar as well sort of raises that question in terms of the African Cup of Nations. Is is that going to be on the radar potentially in terms of 
future acquisitions? You'd think probably not, because ultimately, even when the tournament does clash with with Premier League fixtures, it's it's only a month. So in terms of the long term thinking, it's probably not going to rule out any targets. But the fact of the matter is, having not signed any sort of Jota equivalent this this summer, just gone, we're left with a situation in January where you're looking at Jota to step up, but along with who? I mean, it, it's Origi and Minamino essentially. When you when you sort of Firmino, hopefully will be will be back fit by then. Uh, so there's there's still good options, and you know Minamino and Origi have both kind of stepped up this season to some extent and shown that they still have something to offer. But it's looking a little bit threadbare now, isn't it, Ben? Yeah, I mean, and the dilemma is really is we should have brought someone in over the summer because. Yes, we do have the January transfer window, but if if we do sign someone, let's say ideally in a dream scenario, we sign someone on the first of January, are they going to settle and come in straight away and and replace the products of Salah and Mane? I, it, it's highly unlikely, so you do have to rely on Firmino, Jota, and Firmino being fit, Jota staying fit, hopefully as well, because he has. Apache injury record, and then beyond that, it's Minamino and Dorigi. Uh, but like you know, Salah and Mane were missing against Barcelona, and uh, we did all right in that game. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think there should be as much trepidation heading into that period as a lot of people are like you see on Twitter and stuff. Um, and, and it's an opportunity for young players as well. Uh, maybe it's a bit too soon for Kyle Gordon, but you never know. It. You, normally, uh, th- these these sort of absences can see a, a new young star emerge, like we saw with Harvey Elliott earlier in, in the season, with Ronaldo going mm-hmm. and Elliott coming in and sort of stepping up into the role. So I think Liverpool obviously know what they're doing. Uh, they didn't really see anyone who was fit enough to come in in the market or willing to play as sort of fifth choice behind uh, Jota, Salah, Mane and Firmino. So it, it was a bit of a tough one over the summer. And uh, I think I, I, I highly doubt that they will bring someone in in January to alleviate the absence of Mane and Salah. Mm. Yeah, it's always tricky, but I love the I love the January positivity. We like that attitude. It'll definitely be a big month for Jota. It's been it's been a big start to his Anfield career. Really, he's he's impressed. He's looked very good. Um, we haven't really answered any questions about where his long term future lies, but you know maybe that's part of his appeal. It could be anywhere across the front line. He can do it all, and yeah, it'll be it'll be a big upcoming period for him for Liverpool, and hopefully he can make the difference. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Ben. That pretty much wraps us up. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on Jota, where you think he might end up playing for us. Uh, drop us a message in the comments below. And yeah, be sure to tune in next week for the next Liverpool.com podcast.